Um, so thank you all for coming, and also congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. It is huge to have a book out. It is huge to have finished an incredible amount of work to make it possible. I know you were working on this for a long time, and I know it took a couple different forms um, in the kind of writing that you do. So I wanted to ask you, start out by asking you, where the seed for the book came from, meaning the kind of first thing that you gravitated towards and thought, oh, I want to write my way around that. First of all, thank you. This is lovely. Everybody know Mira. She's the best literary citizen ever. Um, um, I'm, I'm from a tiny town called San Diego, so New York is just amazing for me, so thank you guys. <laughs> thank you all. Um, so the name of the book is Khabar, which means in Bengali, it means food. And it started out as, a, as me being snarky and saying, you know, every American needs to learn uh, Bengali. And one of the words is khabar. <laughs> and so that's what we did. So that's what I, I started out with that. But I've grown up with stories from my father because he was a uh, refugee from what's now Bangladesh. And, um, and he came into India. And it was always a love story about food. Mm. Everything was, oh, the cauliflower was bigger. Um, the roses were you know, fancier. Um, <laughs> you, know. you know the roses. You know the roses. <laughs> Uh, everything was amazing. So, so it was always about food. We always talked about food. We talked about food and politics at the same time. We had discussions of politics while eating food. So there was food in our lives all the time. And so I never could understand when people would say, I just got something from the snack bar and it's good enough for me. So coming to this country, the seed was primarily um, homesickness. It was homesickness. Mm. So what do you do? What do you do when you know you're in a country that you've always wanted to be? but you, you still miss the country you left. And so, so you start cooking, you start making food that your mom used to make, and you make horrible versions of it, you know? <laughs> and then, then you try to improve. And then, you know, parents, as they often do, they die. <laughs> so they did. And so then it was grief. It was grief. It was grief about what, what they brought to me, what I missed out on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the life that was gone. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so basically, it, it was a seed of, of homesickness, grief, and a love story, um, a love letter to my parents and my country I left behind. Mm -hmm. And it's also, I mean, one of the things that I love about this book is because it does sort of revolve around food and the making also of food, right? There's a, there's a making of something in the place where the loss is, right? There's a kind of putting back there. And I love that the essays mirror that as well, like another form of making. Yeah, and I think I'm going to I'm going to actually put that over to Mayuk too, because um, what Mayuk has done, if folks don't know his work, is just spectacular. I mean, I, who am I talking to? I mean, you guys are from New York, you know, you know who, who he is, but. Um, I learned so much from him in, in how to talk about food, how to talk about food uh, in terms of where is it made, where does it belong, mm -hmm. what is important for us to look at when we look at food and, and talk about the hands that touch that mm -hmm. food and the hands that are delivering that food to you, whether it's, it's, it's raw, whether it's cooked, whether it's the person who's cleaning it uh, after you're done eating. So mm -hmm. uh, Mayuk, I'd love for you to add to that. Yeah, totally. First of all, thank you so much for that flattering, um, undeserved can, praise. You can pay me later, pay me later. Uh, <laughs> totally, yeah. Um, no, you know, so, so much of the intention behind this book, this dinky little book that I wrote, Tastemakers, Seven Immigrant Women Who Revolutionized Food in America, is all about, um, oh God, Jesus, no, stop, stop, um, is about honoring uh, the labor that is so often obscured in dominant narratives surrounding food uh, in America. Um, you know, I, through this group biography, what I tried my best to do was uh, turn readers' um, gaze and attention towards uh, the stories of figures who came from marginalized communities uh, who had not necessarily gotten the same um, name recognition as a figure like, say, Julia Child, for example, despite the fact that their work certainly merits that. Uh, and so uh, I began writing this book in uh, 2018, 2019 or so. That's kind of when I sold it. Uh, 
you know, as a corrective to uh, the sort of uh, lapses in uh, dominant narratives. Although, as books tend to do, it kind of morphed into a, you know, a different sort of project. <laughs> but don't want to bore everyone with the uh, details no, actually, about I totally that. Wanna, because my students are here, and I actually do want to follow up with that, because I think there is a moment when you're working on something and it turns into a book. Like, you suddenly understand, oh, this thing that I thought was going to be, first of all, it turns into a bigger thing or a different thing than you thought it was going to be. Um, it turns into a book, and then that book, I always feel like that book turns into a different book than the one you set out to write, right? right totally. So can yes. we talk about both of those movements for you guys? Because I know you both went through that. So what did that look like for you? Yeah, so when um, I did sell this book in late 2018, uh, it was kind of based off of my budding body of work as um, a staff writer at um, a site called Food52, uh, which is, uh, I began working there when I was 24, back in uh, 2016. And I was writing a lot of stories on figures from marginalized communities. Um, so often, uh, you know, women, women of color, people of color, queer people of color like myself, uh, immigrants, uh, you know, all the permutations essentially, uh, people who had not really been given uh, sufficient due. And uh, so it was a friend of mine who looked at those uh, stories and was like, oh, I wonder if there's a way for you to stitch these stories together. And, uh, you know, put them in a book somehow, maybe talk about immigration and food. And I was like, OK, whatever. I'm like a child, but sure, I'll, you know, I'll try to whip this proposal uh, together. <laughs> um, and so fast forward to me actually selling the damn thing. I was like, OK, how do I you know, make sure that these seven different portraits really talk to each other? And what larger story do I want to tell uh, through uh, you know, stitching these portraits together? And that was a huge challenge. I had no idea. You know? And in the proposal stage of my book, mm -hmm. I was very open about that being an unanswered question, you know, mm -hmm. telling my editor and anyone else who had read that proposal that, you know, I'm not quite sure what the grand thesis is, uh, you know, uh, that kind of simmers beneath this project, but mm -hmm. I will arrive at it through my research and reporting. Uh, but it took many drafts for me to kind of get there. So mm -hmm. I'm curious to know what it was like for Madhushree. Um, I spent more time on the proposal, I think. Yeah. Um, the proposal was. Um, so before this, I was trying to write about, uh, I'm still writing it, it's, it's a book called Hutke about outlier women because over and over again, being in science and being in creative writing, you know, they always expect you to be one or the other, but also in corporate America, um, if you're a little aggressive, if you're a little bossy, then they make sure they use those words for women like us. And mm -hmm. so I just wanted to make sure that, you know, I, I could talk about women, especially women of color who are like me, who don't fit that box. Um, and so I was totally gung-ho with that. And then, um, then the damn pandemic happened. So, mm -hmm. so then you start talking about, so I couldn't, I couldn't write. I don't know about the other writers here, but I couldn't write. I was doom scrolling. I was posting stupid things on Twitter. I just wasn't doing much. Nobody has any idea about that, right? <laughs> <laughs> and and, and, and I'm, I'm in the field, so I knew exactly what was happening. And it wasn't helping me at all that I didn't know how the things that I should have known. So, um, so I was cooking a lot. I was posting a lot of pictures. And there was this one proposal that I had worked on about food and just talking about different chefs and, and, and cooks and, um, and, uh, and, and marrying that with my, my own story. So there was a memoir, and then there was highlighting, highlighting cooks, chefs, uh, restaurateurs, um, and how food traveled through immigration, you know, through indenture, through immigration, through uh, slavery. Um, how, do, how does food really travel? And when it does travel to another country, what happens to that food? So, so I was completely into that, and the uh, effing pandemic uh, it really stopped everything. So 30% of the book was written during the pandemic mm -hmm. um, because that's when I realized, you know, when, when you just slow down, if you just slow down and, you know, just stare at your dog, uh, good things happen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, good things happen. Uh, she, she gives you my, uh, her regards. She, she would have loved to come here, too. <laughs> um, but, uh, and, and so it was pretty much about community. I started um, meeting people who grow the food in San Diego. There are lots of urban farmers who grow food there. I started looking at their food, and uh, there are, there's a huge East African um, refugee immigrant population in San Diego. It's the second in the nation. And uh, they grow food in community farms. And the, the food they grow, whether it's kale, greens, sugarcane, um, we can use in our Bengali uh, cuisine. Mm -hmm. So I would make that food and give it back to the farmers because farmers were working. I mean, all of us were sitting at home and getting upset that we were staring at 
at Zoom screens, but farmers were working. And so uh, my, that was my, my contribution to them, to, to go back and give them food. But the food that I was making was very Bengali. So it was a combination of the country I live in and the country I come from, make that food. And that actually got into the book. So the last couple of chapters are, are about how to make peace when nothing is in control. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And also, I'll just say, as a person that was following your Instagram the whole time, the food was getting more and more like ridiculously delicious looking, you know, where you're just like, what is happening over there with you and this creativity? And why don't we live closer? And when are you going exactly. to feed me? That is very um, true. <laughs> but there are was... some goodies, though, in the bag. So after this, yeah. whoever wants to come. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure everyone will be like, yes, we'll be here tomorrow. <laughs> um, but there was something really amazing about watching that process sort of take shape, right? Even from where I was, I could see that there was something happening. I could see that there was something like the, the kind of stickiness of creativity when you're in it, you're in it, which I think is amazing and kind of a lovely thing. Um, I did want to ask you guys for both of your books, was there, like for, for me, I know there was an actual kind of problem that I had to get over to write my book. Like I had to work my way around it. Um, and I had to try a few different things. Actually, I had to try 17 different things mm -hmm. to land one particular part of the book. Um, and I'm wondering if there's anything like that for you when you were writing. If there's anything that you were like, I'm trying to make this piece fit, or I wanted it to be about this, but it's got to be about this, or something that you wanted to have come in that wasn't going to work. Is there anything like that that you came across? You want to take this one first? It's your night, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's my night, people. Um, um, it, it actually involves Mayuk. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> it involves Mayuk. So, um, so Garima Kothari was a uh, chef, a New York chef. And, um, and I knew her, of her. I got to know of her um, after she died. I knew her through a secret group of women writers, the names that shall not be mentioned, but you guys know who they are. And uh, she would be part of that, and she would actually write, and she, we would have conversations. But you know, our online friendships are so intense, but you've never met them, and you don't think you'll ever meet them. So I, I, I met Garima Kothari after her death. And, um, and she, uh, she had a, um, a restaurant called Nukkar. Um, in, in New Jersey, and uh, she had opened that restaurant six weeks before uh, the shutdown, and then New York shut down. Mm -hmm. And um, then she, her last uh, few posts were about uh, do-it-yourself dosa kits that she was trying to sell and really trying to keep the restaurant alive, and she was murdered by her husband. And, um, and, I, and, and my life stopped just, just reading about that because Khabar magazine actually has come up with a um, a statistic that also stopped me, which was 40% of South Asian women are emotionally, physically, financially mm -hmm. abused somewhere or the other some, throughout their lives, which means every other South Asian woman in this country uh, may have a story that you may not know. We don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. We don't talk about it at all. Uh, it's, it's a matter of shame for us. We are the model Im immigrant community. Um, nothing wrong goes in our lives, everything is perfect. Um, and we have our wonderful houses with, uh, and sometimes we even have a dog and, and a few kids. That's our lives. So uh, when I was talking about that, my memoir had been about my 18-year-old um, my relationship that broke down in my marriage, that broke down, and there was emotional abuse that I did not know I was going through. And I really didn't want to make this book about, oh, look at me, I'm so sad. Um, because as you can see, I'm not. Um, so <laughs> so it, it was hard to let go of Garima's story because that still uh, grips me because we haven't, we didn't see the signs, we didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, Mayuk talked about it in a few of his pieces after that. So that's when I, I really started digging into this. Um, and so I married that, but that was really hard for me to write because what you're trying to do is, and I use braided form, the braided essay form, and so I was marrying that with what happened in my life versus what happened in hers, and I didn't know her. So, um, and you've written that in Tastemakers too when, when you've had to go back and look at research and, and work on that. So um, it's a little speculative, but it actually highlights domestic partner abuse, which I think is, a topic in South Asian communities we don't talk about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of dovetailing off of that, um, you know, I would say 
One of the challenges in writing tastemakers was making sure that the text itself didn't just turn into this very anodyne document of like, oh, look at these ladies cooking, you know what I mean? Because I'm sure that a lot of people would pick this book up asking themselves, oh, how did America become this so-called melting pot of different cuisines and cultures throughout history? I want to know that story. But what I wanted to show my readers is that there was so much struggle embedded in making that reality possible for consumers. And you see just a fraction of that struggle in the stories of these seven women. And making sure that I, as I was you know, digging through research and uh, digging through the archives, excuse me, um, I needed to make sure that I was surfacing that pain and that struggle without dwelling upon it too much. Because the last thing that I want to do in framing these stories is to focus too much on the traumas that these women carry, especially ones who are no longer around to talk to me directly and advocate for themselves and tell their own story on their own terms. You know, I want to make sure that I was uh, covering the warts of the, their stories, so to speak, without uh, making that the focus of each chapter. So I think that was the challenge, you know, uh, just making sure that it wasn't that sort of uh, safe, uh, liberal, anodyne, uh, you know, book uh, without being too trauma focused. Right. So the spectrum of what that can be and sort of holding both of those realities. Did you have, um, I don't know, rules for yourself about that? Did you have like ways when you were kind of looking through and editing? Did you have sort of ways that you kind of dealt with that particular problem? Yeah, yeah, totally. You know, um, I would definitely say that in the first draft of my book, you know, I did find myself really, uh, you know, given a lot of real estate to the troubled marriages that some of these women had. Yep. And what I told myself was, well, is this germane to her career in food in any way, you know? Mm -hmm. And if it is, then, you know, it belongs in this chapter in some capacity. But otherwise, you know, that might be something to kind of winnow and uh, scrub out a little bit. Yeah. So that's kind of the rule mm -hmm. I imposed upon myself. Yeah. What about you, Madhushri? Um It focused primarily on food. So for me, uh, very similarly, it wasn't that I was talking about the day-to-day -day life or the issues that they may have, but when it's focusing on food, um, everybody else is um, secondary, including, mm -hmm. the, including the person I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, for example, um, I talked about the Sikh genocide and, and um, and uh, I posted on social media about a lucky, um, uh, my Punjabi tandoor guy who, <laughs> who cooks the best curry. And uh, if I talk to him, he, he's a young kid, like this boy. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, small child, yeah. <laughs> the small child. Um, and you know, he, uh, he's a happy guy. He doesn't want to talk about, you know, when families got massacred in India. Mm -hmm. I mean, even Indians don't talk about it anymore like it never happened. So uh, I wanted to focus on that and mm -hmm. do it through food. So I, while I did talk about um, that that group, I talked about Indira Gandhi's assassination, yep. um, which people know but may not remember. We lived it, so it, it was it was pretty obvious to write about that. But I, I, I wanted to continue to keep the focus on food because this is what happens to food when it travels. And when it travels this way, the stories are actually coming through the food. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So you don't really have to talk about the nitty gritty details of well and then so-and-so didn't like so-and-so's uncle, which we love doing. Like Indians, we, we love gossiping. We love doing that. We, yeah, we love that's doing true. that. But mm. that's gossip. That's, that's not a book. <laughs> so. You know what it makes me think of, though, when, as both of you guys are talking? I was totally off topic and yet on topic. I feel for like the last mm, 30 years, one of the things that is often said to me as a South Asian writer is, oh, you guys are really having a moment. Right, oh. but it's been for 30 years. People have been saying, "You guys are really having a moment," mm -hmm. right? It's never, and it's sort of like it's always sort of relegated to that thing, and it's as though it just happened, and it might last eight months, and but this is always the way it's told to me. And I'm wondering, do you, do you guys do you get that too? Uh, to some extent, I do. Sorry, I don't want to no, no. hog the mic. Um, yeah, I, don't. I, I will say that uh, you know I was kind of surprised. Uh, at uh, some of the resonance that uh, people saw um, in my book, um, mm. in the sense that, uh, you know, 
if anyone is familiar with the tenor of the American food media, especially over the past uh, two, three years or so, mm -hmm. there have been a lot of changes, a lot of public upheavals at certain publications, like Bon Appetit, for example, based on allegations of um, racism against uh, employees of color, along with other forms of discrimination. Uh, and I would see a lot of folks kind of uh, slot my book into this category of like, oh, you know, this, this book is a kind of a response to that moment, or it's helping us make sense of that chaos. And I was like, okay, you know, I didn't, I didn't see my, my book uh, in that way um, mm -hmm. as kind of tethered to this specific moment in the culture. Mm. You know, I, I kind of conceive of it as a more um, evergreen uh, text, and I hope that, uh, you know, it does stand the test of time, so to speak, you know, but uh, it did mm. feel kind of weird to be to see, uh, you know, my work commodified in that way. But, you know, yeah. I didn't get too much of like, oh, you know, brown skinned folks like you are having a little moment, you know? I don't, yeah. I don't know why. Maybe it's because of the fact that uh, the nature of my book is a scholarly uh, one as opposed to um, having any notes of memoir, you know? Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, uh, you know, South Asian authors who do write memoirs get that sort of. Um, uh, unimaginative response even more than someone like me would, you know? Yes. I don't know. So. I make, I'm, like, I'm going to answer it. <laughs> no, but um, I, I was just thinking of the thing that was often said to me was, um, and it was funny because it it's been for the last however many years it's been out, it's so important, like, right now. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so urgent right now. And I'm like, well, it's been, I don't know, guys. It's been like five years. Right. Uh, Really been urgent for you know yeah, what I mean. But it's like, then, huh? It has a lot to tell us today. <laughs> <It's> necessary, <laughs> exactly. right? Urgent and necessary are those two key words that people love to use. Well, I know. I, I just you know. I feel like when that happens, that that's another another uh, way of othering us over and over again, and it it gets tiresome after a while. We've been in this country long enough. Some of us have been born here, brought up here. You know, this is America, warts and all. This is what we are. Um, you know, this country gives us the ability to to critique it. It gives us the ability to do things that I don't think in my home country I could do. The things that I've said here and done here. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I it it's it's. I I had decided. Let me tell you a story. I had tell decided <laughs> I had decided when I was writing, I started with fiction and then I moved into nonfiction, that I would never write about jasmine, roses, cumin, coriander. Mm -hmm. I had decided, I'm like, this is bullshit. This is all that they think we do. You know, long hair, troubled women who find this nice white guy who rescue them. So I'm not going to write about it. And... Um, I didn't write about the white guy who rescued whoever, but, um, but I, I wrote about food. So sometimes you, you, you need to say, no, I don't want to do this, uh, or don't apply any rules. But the biggest thing that people do come back when they come back and look at my book, which is a collection of braided essays, talks about immigration, talks about women in science, talks about people of color, is we don't know what this is because you talk about so many things. And to that, I say, this is what we are. We are many things. We are many. We are not having a moment. We are many things. And, and we are here to stay. So just get used to this. This is the kind of work that's going to come around over and over again. And I'm sure a lot of uh, students in this audience are actually writing something similar. Mm -hmm. Did I ever tell you what happened with my first novel? It was the same thing mm -hmm. where I went in and what they said, it was funny because it was the editor said, you have an immigrant story and a political story and a love story and a ghost story. And so we have to go with the most important story. Like you've thrown mm -hmm. everything in here, so we have to go with the most important story. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. Well, what is the most important story? And yeah. she said, well, obviously it's the immigrant story. <laughs> right? Duh, yeah. Right. Of course. And, um, and I remember, I mean, it was, it was a moment because I remember kind of kicking my agent under the table like, no. Let's not do this. And she basically said, like, we got out of the room. And she's like, yeah, you can't go with that person. Mm. But I've always been haunted. And I think I've talked to my class about this before. I've always been haunted by the idea of how many other stories that editor got a hold of and sort of denuded and shaped so that it's like this kind, this is the story mm -hmm. that I find most worthwhile. This is where I see you. I can see you as long as you're telling me your immigrant story. Exactly. But if you try it for any other complexity, that's you've gone out of your lane, yeah, right? Totally. Yeah. Which is a really wild feeling. Yeah, totally. I mean, I will say that um, 
you know, just in uh, having the pleasure of traveling with this proposal for tastemakers, mm -hmm. you know, I did have so many meetings like that in which I could feel uh, editors wanting to slot me into, mm. you know, certain categories or impose certain restrictions upon mm. the book based on, you know, the pressures of the market, so to speak. <laughs> and uh, it was, you know, it's, I can't say that every writer has the privilege of ending up with an editor who really understands their sensibility, True. you know, True. and I'm so glad that I did find that person, you know, but I think about how many writers from marginalized communities uh, do not have that happen to them, you know, or don't yeah. have that option. So. Did you see, I, I feel like there's just so many shoulders yeah. that we stand on in that way. Like I'm very aware of how many people how many people like put their stories down first so that we could walk through those Absolutely. doors? It feels really intense. Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about what he just said. Yeah. Um, I'm going to science you guys a little bit. Um, so so um, when you're trying to um, engineer a protein or, or DNA, right? Uh, you stick it in bacteria. You, you grow the cells. How many people uh, are in science? Stop it. How many people? <laughs> Stop. <laughs> um, so, so you grow, grow it in broth, and then you put it on media. I cannot believe I'm giving you a lecture no, on this. No, this is amazing. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you put it up on broth, and then you have a marker. You use uh, an antibiotic that it's resistant to, blah, blah, blah. You have to find, and there'll be lots and lots of what we call cells growing in colonies. And and you need this one cell that has that one mutation that you need in order for you to design this protein that in turn is going to give you the response that you need in a drug or whatever uh, your research you're working on. And I feel the same way. I know it's a long story, but I feel it's the same way about editors. It's the same thing. You can go around to 100 editors and have wonderful conversations, but they don't have the mutation you need. And the mutation you need is someone who's going to be your unabashed, passionate champion, even when you're giving up, when you're like, what the fuck am I writing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they have to be the ones saying, this is what it is. You know you, you can do it. Go back and do it again. And University of Iowa Press has been fantastic for me. I mean, yeah, I, tell me about that. Oh my God, they've been amazing. Like the biggest champions ever. I, I say everybody go to them for all your books because they're, they're, they love words. Mm -hmm. They are kind. They are uh, sensible. They, mm -hmm. don't, they are not expecting you to finish things with a turnaround of like 24 hours. But the beautiful part about that is, is how they quietly champion you. And I've been, I've been I'm not religious but I've been blessed has um, did your editor ever ask something of the book that sent you into a tailspin no no amazing no actually no uh, or, or or produced but, a different kind of work but I, but tailspin is a negative spin on that wait hold on I'm backing up <laughs> I don't mean that I mean did it did your editor ever ask a question that you're like what and then it, it so kind of that, shot out in a different kind yeah, of work. yeah so so remember the the uh, book proposal yeah so my editor helped me craft my book proposal that I then went back and gave it to them. And they said, OK, we accept it. <laughs> it was a year and a half. <laughs> a year and a half of, no, it's not enough. This is not enough. And I literally had to go back and figure out what, what is she looking for and what is this press looking for in order mm -hmm. for this to make, make mm -hmm. it successful for them. Because regardless of being writers, regardless of what it is, this is a product and the press is taking a chance on you. So you, you don't want to disappoint them as much as you don't. I understand it's your baby and all that, but uh, at the end of the day, it's a product. So, um, so it took me about four iterations of that with this editor. And then they, uh, this is uh, Nina Mukherjee Furstenau, who's written an amazing book about food, too. Mm -hmm. And she's the editor of uh, the Food Story series of uh, University of Iowa Press. And then it was taken into the press. So um, I think that changed how I would write the rest of the essays. That's so interesting. Yeah. I also love that, that she helped you write the proposal. Oh, yeah. The proposal, which is basically the invitation, like, will you come to this? And they're like, hold on, say it to me this way. Yes. Say it to me Try this it again. way. Try it again. <laughs> what about you? Yeah, um, there was um, a moment early on in the process after I delivered my first draft um, that really surprised me um, for my editor. And so, you know, I had these seven uh, stories of seven different women, uh, you know, in that first draft. 
And my editor said, oh, I noticed the name Julia Child is popping up a lot in each of these chapters. I wonder if it is worth devoting a short essay, we can call it an interlude or something, to Julia Child that analyzes her legacy from uh, you know, a different sort of angle than dominant narratives have in the past. And I said, huh, that's fascinating because, you know, a Julia Child's story has been told to death, and it's th that continues. You know, there's an HBO Max uh, series that just came out, uh, mm -hmm. and so and yet, you know, I found it really productive to kind of put myself through that exercise of writing about Julia Child because um, I think that one kind of obvious fact that I think a lot of those um, you know aforementioned narratives have maybe um, obscured a tiny bit is the fact that you know she was a by her own admission, a waspy um, American, white American woman. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, a waspy American woman. Wa waspy white is redundant. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, from Pasadena, um, you know, and she carried so much material racial privilege uh, that allowed her to become a great teacher of uh, French cooking uh, to American audiences from the 1960s onward. And, you know, a lot of the women in my book, uh, you know, they had been compared to her in ways that, like, oh, she'll never measure up to Julia Child and the, you know, standard that she set. And so, what I asked myself was, you know, can you revisit every, uh, you know, all these um, archival materials on Julia Child and uh, find instances of her really understanding, uh, you know, the. Uh, nature of her privilege and the fact that you know she was able to rise to stardom in ways that other women with fewer privileges were not able to, um, and so I had to kind of craft that uh, essay that ended up being about three thousand words long, so substantially shorter than other chapters, uh, and. You know, through that, I needed to make sure that I was being generous to her and not being like Julia Child. You know, here's a takedown. You know, because that that feels so incurious. Um, you know, to me as um, a writer, I think, especially when you're writing about deceased figures. You know, um, mm -hmm. I think that what I wanted to do was understand uh, kind of her intentions um, as someone working in the field um, in a different time than the one that we inhabit now. Um, and so that was a really fun challenge. I think that I like to think that it served the book well ultimately. Mm -hmm. But you know, readers, you tell me. You know. Maybe we'll be like, I disagree, you know, which is fine. I mean, that's so interesting because also it's that it's that thing of um, when you're writing against a kind of dominant narrative, right? To kind of inhabit the narrative with love and also the lens of scrutiny, right? So both. Mm -hmm. Totally. And that makes the writing grow then. Like, that's such a tough exercise, but it really, you can feel the writing growing. Right, you're right, exactly. Because, you know, I think I've outgrown my uh, stage of, you know, being a young writer who is like, this thing sucks, you know? And, uh, you know, I'm just kind yeah. of uh, penning a diatribe that has a lot of, uh, you know, momentum and is fun to read, but maybe not, will not age, um, you know, as well as I would like my writing to, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, you can agree, um, or disagree respectfully, either ways is fine, you know, at the end of the day. Uh, it's how you want to conduct your life and how you want to conduct your writing. So, you know, either ways, I think, you know, when, when people do do those takedowns, if we'd love to ask them, you know, what do you like yourself afterwards? If you do, then you should keep doing it. <laughs> Secretly, I want to be like, no, they don't like themselves. <laughs> people have to be better. Um, I, I imagine that's my fantasy. Um, so is there a point, and by the way, you guys, we're going to be taking audience questions probably in not too long. Um, so have those ready whenever you have them. But um, I wanted to ask you guys also about, was there anything about writing your books that surprised you in the process, something that you didn't see coming? And that sort of was like, oh, this is, this is a different way, or this is a different thing, or this is, you know what I mean? Like something that sort of unpacked itself in front of you as you were moving toward it. Um, yeah, lots of things, actually. Yeah. So I'm, I don't know how many of you are from India or South Asia, but you know, we, we are stuck in the decade we left. So mm -hmm. I'm still a Shah Rukh Khan fan. You know, I'm still okay with Madhuri. <laughs> okay with Madhuri. <laughs> um, uh, Kajol, you know, it, it was, it, you know, that's where, that's where we're stuck. And so my thing was I was going to work on, on this book, really talking about my love affair with India, you know, just, just how much I love the country, yeah. which by that I meant food. <laughs> but, but it was like how much I love the country. And I ended up 
surprised with how much uh, um, anger I felt. Huh. Anger I felt with what's happening to my country right now. And I yeah. say that my country because this is my country too, so I just don't want you guys to get confused. But that, you know, immigrants, we, we belong everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but the anger uh, with regards to how, how we are treating each other, uh, how the <coughs> government hasn't um, delivered in years and we still keep going back. I'd written a Long Reads essay, I think last year, when the Delta virus. Um, screamed through India, and um, and there were friends and family members and neighbors, you know, on WhatsApp. You know, WhatsApp groups for Indians. It's it's like where all the uncles and aunties just send each other good morning texts, <laughs> and uh, and suddenly this. And I'm an auntie, so um, just in case you thought. Um, and so you know, I would get all these texts from my school friends, and then suddenly those texts changed, and they became, you know, can I get an oxygen cylinder here? Yeah. Can I get an oxygen cylinder yeah. them? So and so died. Uh, I don't know how to cremate them because there is there is a long line at the crematorium, um, and I'm saying that because I don't want people at New York to forget about what happened to us there because us uh, people in here we we were helpless. We couldn't even go back and do anything, and. Um, and the government didn't do anything. Government actually had a super spreader event right before that. Um, I haven't talked about it in the book. I wish I had not submitted my book before because I would have talked about it because that's how much I feel that we destroyed that country. Nobody even knows how many people died. Millions of people died. Mm -hmm. uh, people were not given the respect uh, when, when they died uh, of, of how they were cremated or buried. Um, and the same government got elected again. So um, I, I bring this up as an American citizen, because I have to be careful when I say these things, but I'd like to bring this up primarily because as, as American citizens, this is the power we have. This is the freedom we have to talk about it. And what I realized was, uh, in the book I talked about how we protest, how we, mm -hmm. how we uh, talk about uh, uh, tea as a colonial uh, weapon. Yep. Um, this is my protest, and I'm, I'm really angry with how my country has shaped up to be. And I have hope. I have hope. But, uh, but I feel like we, we need the support of people who live outside of India. Mm -hmm. on that. That's what I learned. Mm -hmm. It's also so interesting to me when you go, when you think that you're going to turn to something with um, love and nostalgia, and you find that under it is a fair amount of anger and a fair mm -hmm. amount of frustration. Yeah. Like that in itself is such a transformative process. Yes. And that's, I mean, like I said, I keep saying it, it was a, it, it's a love story to my country. It still is. But when you love, love somebody, you love a country, yeah. uh, there is also anger, and you, you should be allowed to express that. And there's critique, of course. Yeah. Uh, in terms of what surprised me, mm -hmm. um, you know, as I was writing, um, I think it was, sorry to be corny about this, but, you know, how much I learned about myself in writing, uh, you know, the stories <laughs> <laughs> of all these, um, you know, women who are not me, uh, because, you know, when I was writing each story, you know, these were women who worked in uh, very different eras than the one that I inhabit, as I was saying earlier. Uh, you know, uh, they were up against certain pressures that I will never, uh, you know, I, I may never, hopefully never, have to experience in my lifetime, uh, even though I fought my own battles, especially as a queer person of color in a very discriminatory industry. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, what was tough initially um, in stitching these portraits together and crafting each one was, you know, how do I make sure that I'm accessing the inner emotional life of each woman, uh, you know, just based on, you know, the memoirs that I'm working off of or, uh, you know, interviews that I am, uh, you know, spending time with that they gave to the press so I can understand kind of their own voice and how they carried themselves and what they cared about and so on and so forth. Uh, and so I had to kind of figure out, like, okay, well, how do I relate to an aspect of this woman's story? And that unlocked so much for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, through that process, I came to better understand just this uh, unexpected journey that I've been on uh, in uh, food media for the past five years. I never set out to be a food writer, uh, and I have grave discomfort now with even calling myself a food writer because mm. it implies a skill set that I don't possess. I'm neither a recipe developer nor a restaurant enthusiast. You know, I'm just like, I eat food, you know, and I write about like, <laughs> people who make it, you know. Um, 
But uh, as a result, you know, um, I was kind of, you know, asking myself throughout the process of writing this book, well, you know, how, what, what do I make of these past five years in this industry that I never saw a place for uh, myself? And uh, you know, I think writing each of these stories really helped me, uh, you know, get some answers that I was all, uh, just kind of grasping towards. So that's how amazing. About, how about you? Uh, what? what did you learn when you wrote your book? Oh too? Lord. Um, <laughs> Okay, what did I learn when I wrote my book? Um, I, I think the biggest, uh, so I wrote a book about, um, I drew a book about race and about my family um, falling apart a bit. And, um, and I think the thing that I, thank you, thank you for that. Um, I think the thing that I learned was I did not set out to write a memoir and nor did I think I'd written a memoir. And so they surprised me with the subtitle, which is a memoir in conversations. <laughs> and that sent a deep level of panic through me mm. um, because, I, because I don't consider myself with an exciting enough life to write a memoir. You know what I mean? Like I just, I should have had like an alcoholic mother, or, you know what I mean? <laughs> Something that was like really a little more, more gripping. Um, and I think reckoning with that idea of what does it mean if this is a memoir? What if you are putting down something that is quite ordinary to you, mm -hmm. but could be extraordinary and that other people exactly. have also felt it. What if it's just that, yep. right? What if it doesn't have to be a bigger story than it is to just live as a conversation? Mm. Which was, um, weirdly, it was like a humbling moment and it was also a kind of coming together moment where mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, okay, you got this. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I want to give you guys a chance to ask questions as well. Yeah, um, this is the moment where we're going to shift to audience questions. So um, Oliana is going to stand with the microphone down um, by the stage. So if you have a question for any or all of our wonderful guests, you can go right up to the microphone and ask a question and then form a line uh, up the aisle. And to our Zoom audience, you can just put your questions right in the Q&A tab on Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. All right, one of my students. Let's go. I'm kind of short. <laughs> I feel incredibly nervous. You got this. You're great. Hello, everybody. <laughs> sorry, sorry, not to get too loud. I know you just talked about how you're not like a, a food writer per se, but I have a question for you two as as food writers, if that's okay. I was just I was just thinking about the. Um, the quote unquote food writing that I do engage with a lot. And it happens to be mainly through YouTube, actually. Uh, weirdly enough. Yeah, and it's actually very, um, you mentioned Bon Appetit, and it's really unfortunate, actually, the, um, the way that all turned out, because Bon Appetit really was a great platform for lots of um, food writers of color to really come out and um, do a lot of great stuff, like Christina Shea, um, these other really great names. Mm -hmm. And I was just um, thinking about that and the fact that, however, despite what I just said, a lot of the food people that I watch on YouTube are actually white white people, white males, like um, in particular like Adam Ragusea and Joshua Weissman, who are starting to get a lot of fame. And I was wondering um, if you have any names um, that I should investigate in terms of food writers of color that are coming out, and maybe even on this platform. I don't know how familiar you are. You all are with with um, food food writers or food YouTubers, um, but I'd lo love to engage with that content more because, um, despite how great I think Adam Ragusea is, and especially with handling um, food from other cultures and um, doing really great research and stuff like that, I would like to engage with um, food YouTubers of color. And um, you know, uh, this is a question. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, thank you. Do you want to take that? Yeah, question? Oh, okay. Uh, I'm trying to think of, <laughs> like, oh, now I have to like figure out an answer. Um, you know, I would say in terms of uh, video personalities, um, to speak to what you just asked. Um, uh, this is a former uh, Bon Appetit person, but um, Rick Martinez um, is now doing. Uh, he's videos. fantastic. <laughs> Sorry. He's fantastic. Yeah, he's wonderful, and he now has um, a pretty giant platform at my former employer, Food Fifty Two, and I think that his videos have been a delight. Um, and another person who comes to mind immediately is Eric Kim, who is a staff writer at the New York Times yes. cooking session, mm -hmm. uh, section, Jesus. Um, and I realized that I named uh, you know, two folks who are connected to very powerful institutions. <laughs> uh, and 
you know, in terms of food writers of color who are not necessarily uh, creating work on YouTube, uh, who I think uh, folks should check out. Um, one is uh, the writer Vidya Balachander. Uh, she is the um, editor of uh, Whetstone um, South Asia um, Vertical. So Whetstone is an independent uh, food magazine, uh, and it was uh, founded by Stephen Satterfield, whom some and of you may know. Everybody needs to read Whetstone magazine. Yeah, Whetstone is wonderful, and it was uh, started by um, Stephen Satterfield, whom some of you may know as the host of Netflix's High on the Hog, um, and he's another person who comes to mind immediately. Um, but um, you know, Vidya Balachander, uh, she writes um, extensively um, for places including uh, Whetstone, and she has taught me so much about uh, you know my ancestral homes food, and mm -hmm. so I advise any uh, you know anyone with a passing interest in this field to check out her yeah. work. Vidya is Vidya is amazing. Um, uh, the Zinara Ratnaike a Sri Lankan um, food writer, amazing work. Um, I'm not a YouTube person, so I'm sorry I can't give you directions there, <laughs> but um, the, the one person who has taught me a lot through her words is this uh, food writer, uh, Sharanya Deepak. So if you ever, ever get to read her, her essay on Popula, P-O-P-U-L-A, -P uh, called There Is No Such Thing Like Dalit Cuisine. It's, mm. it's about the mm. underrepresented, um, uh, underprivileged, beyond the caste system, uh, how we deprive people of food because of caste. Um, blew my mind, blew my, you have to read her work. Um, so if you can, and Tejal Rao, of course, is there, Kushbu Shah is there, you know, all these uh, interesting uh, editors and authors who actively um, help us think of food the right way. I uh, truly enjoy Nick Sharma. I think Nick is fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not because he used to be a molecular biologist by trade. <laughs> But it is a little. Yes, <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. Also, so for the websites you just mentioned, so Whetstone, I assume it's spelled the same way as the knife tool? Question mark? No, no. I mean, W H E T. W H E T. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Popular, you said? Popular. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Come on down. <laughs> um, I have a question um, which you touched on a little bit about. I have this term mango breasty, which is often like my term for like exotified South Asian um, literature. So, you know, mangoes, you know, breasts like mangoes or whatever, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, you know, just also I thought it was interesting. You talked about like not wanting to write about that mm -hmm. stuff and then you ended up writing about mm -hmm. some of that. Mm -hmm. But I was curious, and this question is for all of you, the cover of your book mm -hmm. is also kind of like in that sort of category of, you know, this exotified South Asian kind of, you know, it has something that looks like a sari or like a fabric. Mm -hmm. and, it is a sari. And it doesn't have food either on it, right? Mm -hmm. It has got the cha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but did you have any say on like what your covers would look like? And was that something that was a conversation you were interested in having with your publishers? Yeah, actually I did. I, I took this picture and yeah. I specifically wanted this cover because uh, it, when you talk about kabar, kabar doesn't only mean food as we think about it, for us, kabar was also cha. And I, I wanted that to be the image because everybody talks about the memories of my childhood or stories of you know, the marriage or whatever, but I really wanted people to look at this picture and say, okay, when does she talk about cha? Right. And I talk about cha as an act of protest, as an act of colonialism, mm -hmm. and that imperialists got tea into India. Masala chai didn't just happen overnight. We just didn't wake up one day and say, we are masala chai people. Uh, it was foisted on us. Um, and, and foist is an interesting word. Mm. It? it is. Yeah. It is. So, um, so, so that's why it was, it was that's very great. deliberate on my part to, uh, to actually focus on, on tea, which, and I'm glad you picked on that because, um, yes, I did not want to talk about exoticism of food, um, but this is also an image that I think will make people think about what Indian food really is. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll try to answer this one quickly um, because I know others are in line. Um, yeah, I did definitely have say in what my cover looked like. Um, one thing that I was very adamant with about, um, or with uh, regarding, um, you know, who was going to design it was I wanted a, a woman or non-binary designer um, for 
um, this uh, book because you know uh, I think it just reflects the spirit of uh, you know the project, and I was very fortunate to find. Um, you know, end up with someone who uh, named Amit Malhotra, who is um, a non-binary designer based in uh, India, and um, I think that they did um, a job that I am very, I think, really captures the spirit of the um, you know book. But I, I did have some input. I didn't have total you know reins over like no, like you know this like flower has to go here or something like that, you know. But um, I would just say I, I um, yes. I spent, so you have so much leeway with your publisher, which is not a lot. Um, you have to kind of conserve your strengths for something. I saved all of my strengths for fighting about the covers um, because I specifically was like, do not give me an elephant, do not give me a Taj Mahal, do not give me this, um, especially with my first novel. And then the second one is actually just 13 drawings of me, and I was like, yeah, that's good. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, Marishri. Hello, Mayuk. Um, thank you for such an edifying talk. Um, my question is like, as so as, and and for as I guess a question for everyone on the stage, but as people who have done journalism, food writing, written about other people, um, now to have books that kind of put you in the spotlight in which people are writing about you, um, what has your experience been of maybe being like trying? You know, in your writing, trying to get out of being pigeonholed, and then maybe through your press or tours or um, the experience of promoting your work, then being tr put back perhaps into mm -hmm. those kind of like rigid boxes. If you've had experiences like that um, from the press or um, you know photographers, just that experience of self-promotion of your work. What has that been like as, you know, South Asian folks, mm -hmm. queer folks? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want to take this one first? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, thank you, Leah. Um, so for me, it hasn't been, um, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you another story. Um, mm -hmm. What has happened is people, when they, if there are phone conversations or, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations with journalists, they come back and they'll say, you know, you have such a lot of trauma in your life. You had this happen to you and then that happened to you. Like, I mean, anybody else would have curled up and died, and, but for that, you're surprisingly jolly. And so, <laughs> it's, it's <been> sorry. Uh, <laughs> but, um, so, so that's been interesting that you know people automatically expect that if you're writing about serious things and you're you're actually talking about feminism in the way that it happens in South Asia or, or domestic partner abuse, you don't have to be sitting around curled up. Not all of us do that. We have many different ways of doing this, but I don't do that. So, so that, that's, been, um, that's been interesting. But I use platforms like this for people to understand we are three-dimensional people for mm -hmm. crying out loud. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, there are moments, but that's not how I wake up every morning and, and you know, sing a sad song, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's been fascinating for me because um, I think receiving certain forms of institutional recognition early in my career um, taught me a bit about how people are willing to commodify me. Like, oh, look at this, you know, like a young brown child is a queer person of color, yeah, a child of immigrants, yada, yada. And so that taught me a lot in terms of like, okay, I want to make sure that that doesn't happen when my book comes out and that I'm not commodifying myself in that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, but mm -hmm. I began to worry at some point uh, in the book publicity process that I had almost overcorrected because, uh, you know, the question of why is someone who presents as a man to this world writing a book about uh, women's lives? Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, for those of you who pick up the book, um, I handle that in a certain way. Um, I talk about my relationship to gender and gender expression as a queer person uh, and how uh, that made me gravitate towards telling these stories in the way that I've chosen to. Um, despite the fact that I do present as a cis male to the public, yet I did notice that um, you know a few um, reviews, I would say, um, ones that were wonderful and so positive, and I'm sure moved a lot of books from my publisher, so I can't be too angry about this. Um, um, you know, they did handle um, that what I saw as a nuance kind of indelicately, you know, and so that kind of uh, tasked me with, you know, if I am talking to a journalist uh, for a certain publication, you know, to make sure that I'm super clear about, you know, my identity and how that did inform the way I approached this work um, so that, you know, 
I, I made sure that whatever reviewers were not picking up on, I was able to articulate yeah. on my own terms. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, um, sorry, I was like, yes, great. Um, I think the thing that is, has been uh, the most difficult for me to parse in being public about work is there is the you that writes to a point of real curiosity, mm. and it's usually something very raw, and it's usually something that you're exploring in your work, and there's a delicacy to that work, and there's a way that you show up for it, and you try to honor the people in it and yourself. And then there's the you that goes on the road and has to answer for it over and over and over again, and that thing that was once so sacred becomes something that is outside of you and that other people pass around and that part of it is actually quite harrowing um, mm -hmm. and sort of and so I have ways in which I speak to myself after I'm on tour and ways in which I take care of myself after I'm on tour so that I can reclaim the parts of me that got scattered on the road mm -hmm. thank you thanks hi I'm Hannah um, I'm curious about what are your writing routines do I have one? Um, <laughs> God. Sorry. Well, what I gets did... you in a zone? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to answer this one <laughs> right now. Um, I have a full-time job that... <laughs> I have a full-time job that is completely different from my writing life. And so um, I think for the past 20 years or so, and don't hate me, but I... I used to write two hours in the morning before going into work and then come back home and then write two hours after that. It just became habit. So it was, you know, fingers on laptop, ass in chair. That's what it was, you know? It wasn't glamorous. It wasn't glamorous. That's what it was. My friends knew not to bother me over weekends. I would call them in the evening, like, do not text me, do not call me, because I'm writing. Uh, I needed that. If I, if I didn't have that, then I couldn't write. So for me, I had to be disciplined about that. And then before the pandemic, uh, I, for work, I would travel all over, um, you know, long distance travel. And that was perfect because Wi-Fi doesn't work for shit on planes. So, you know, so, ah, so good, isn't it? So good. So, so that, that was my routine. Um, I'm reclaiming that back now. So. Mm -hmm. um, I get on a Zoom with two other South Asian women and we write all day on mute. And occasionally, someone will be like, I have a question about a thing. And then we'll talk to each other, and then we'll go back to writing. That's great. Uh, yeah, I would say my semblance of a routine right now is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a morning writer. So I try to just, uh, you know, um, really make sure that I wake up early enough so that my mm -hmm. brain is functioning. And then, uh, you know, get all the good words down as much as possible. Obviously, take a break for exercise and meals and everything like that and going outside. Um, but you know, by night, I would say my brain, uh, you know, gets all scrambled and everything. So what I really forced myself to do, and I think was ultimately very helpful for me in getting this book down, and will hopefully be helpful in the next book, is to force myself to sit down and like watch a movie or watch a soap opera or something that will actually inspire me and that isn't uh, staring at uh, my laptop. It is another screen, right? But you know, it's it's another form of art that I think uh, teaches you a lot about storytelling, and I think that that was so helpful for me to like you know, every single night, watch like, you know, a, a movie that was, you know, got a Best Actress nomination or something like that, or watch General Hospital or Young and the Restless or something. <laughs> really helped, honestly. So that's my routine. <laughs> Young and the Restless. Didn't Amazing. Even it's gotten that. pretty bad these days, <laughs> but that's all. Thank you so much. That was super thank helpful. You. Thank you. Hi, all. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so this question is primarily for Mother Shree, but um, all of you feel free to answer it. Um, <laughs> earlier, you mentioned that uh, your grief played a role in you thinking about the source of this book and developing it. Yeah. And I was curious um, for all of you how you've reflected and thought through that relationship um, as uh, I think all of you have at different points mentioned um, that you, know, you live here um, mm -hmm. but clearly have South Asian roots of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, with that relationship being like, heritage and blood in particular parents or family, as those people pass or get closer to passing, how has that um, kind of mental notion of your relationship with food and, and, and culture through family kind of, mm -hmm. have you thought through that? Yeah, yeah no, that, yeah. that's a good, a good question. So, um, so I didn't cook Bengali food till my mother died um, because she was there. She would cook for me. Why the heck would I learn that? And then suddenly out of the blue, it's like whoop. It's gone, you know. Not only did I not cook, I wouldn't even step in the kitchen because she was there. And so, 
when she left, it's not, I was cooking other food, but not, not this. When she left, it was, it was muscle memory, it's your brain memory, your brain cells basically keeping alive a memory that was uh, about how she was cutting vegetables or fish or chicken and what she was adding and the smells is what guided me to, to actually start cooking. And it, it sounds really woo-woo, but I will tell you, you know, I'm from San Diego, I can say all these things and get away with it. <laughs> uh, so, but it, it literally was channel, channel, channeling her. Um, and, if, you know, my sister, who's a very private person, she's a significantly better cook than me. So sometimes I will actually, uh, you know, call her up and ask her for recipes, but, but every time I've, I've cooked, most of the recipes that you see in this book um, are, are grief love notes to my mm -hmm. parents because this is what I, I would have loved for them to have read this because they'd be like, tu <laughs> like, They will be very, um, they would not believe that I can even cook. That's what it is. <laughs> you know? So, so um, I, I say to all South Asians who have roots uh, back home and live here, um, regardless of how irritating your parents are, love them. It's very important. Mm. It's very important. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, I'll take this. Oh, yeah, I'll take this quickly. Um, my, my father died uh, five years ago, cancer. Um, and I think that uh, has informed my work in this project in particular in the sense that, uh, you know, a few months after uh, he died, I started to forget just how he moved through the world and his mannerisms, his voice, everything that, you know, all these aspects of his self that uh, were so familiar to me, um, you know, for the majority of my life. And uh, I, had this anxiety and I still wake up sometimes, mm. you know, wanting to uh, mm. experience him like that again, you know, and um, I think that that experiencing that loss, uh, you know, relatively early in life, um, I would say just kind of reinforced my desire to, uh, you know, tell the stories of people who maybe did not get uh, their due, at least to my mind, uh, during their lifetimes, and do so in a way that is as sensitive and respectful um, as possible and honors the fullness, uh, because um, I think that, you know, writing is one way of making sure that, uh, you know, someone's memory doesn't die right along with them, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will just add to that that um, probably the most uh, peaceful I felt while I was writing my book was when I got to draw my dad who also died of cancer many years ago but just um, making the lines on his face and there's a chapter that he appears in where um, where we get high together I know but he was dying he was dying that's why <laughs> um, it was it was a cancer pot um, but just being able to um, draw that um, and just sort of tell that story the way I needed to tell it mm -hmm. was such a release from the kind of grip of the illness that I had been in for so long. Thank you all. Hi everyone, my name's Rajesh. Uh, thank you so much for a really fascinating conversation. It's been fantastic. So much yeah. it, of it resonates with me as someone who was born in India, grew up in England, and now lives in the US, and really misses my mum's cooking as well, and tries to emulate it, not very successfully, often. Um, I'd love to get your take on something that I very much believe, that for diaspora and migrant communities, the food we grew up with mm -hmm. takes on greater significance. Mm -hmm. it's, it not only reminds us where we came from, but it helps us figure out who we are in the places that we now call home. It helps us navigate often multiple cultures, and I'd just love to get your take on that. I'm looking at the food writers. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I no longer self-identify as a food writer. <laughs> I, I think what happens when you move, let's say, as you said, you moved from um, India to England to America, uh, we're always looking for what connects us back to what our roots are. And sometimes for folks like you, maybe you know, there are people who, who feel very connected to England rather than India. Um, and sometimes you, know, you move here and you forget all that and, and this is where you're connected. Um, I've basically noticed a lot of South Asian immigrant um, people that I know are, are still connected to what was childhood comfort food. And they will try to recreate it regardless of, of whether the atta or the 
uh, whole wheat flour is the same brand or not, but if we did get the same brand from Potato Brothers, that's the one we want. Um, and so you try to recreate it that way, but I, I feel like it's not the food that matters, it's the memory associated with that food that makes us do what we do. Um, so one example I'll give you is, I love making luchi, luchi alu. And that's a very Bengali thing. Uh, it's potatoes with you know, uh, 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 all-purpose flour, um, deep fried, uh, Puffed dough. That's mm -hmm. what it is. So yeah. hungry now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And you know what you need to do if you guys want to ever make it? Use a tortilla maker to make mm. it. That's the best way to do it's it. Like that's like an tiki. Sorry? Like a tiki. No, that's uh, puri. Uh -huh. okay. So puri in North India is made out of atta or whole wheat. Mm -hmm. Luchi is made out of all purpose flour. And you will know if you go to somebody's house, Indian person's house, and they make puris versus luchi. Um, you'll know whether they're your people or not. <laughs> so uh, I'm not talking about being a snob. It's, it, it's being, uh, trying to figure out where you belong. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how, that's how food has always been for me. And a lot of uh, South Asians that I talk to, there's a, a Yuba City um, community, Sikh, Punjabi Sikh Mexican community, and they make roti quesadillas. They make lamb burritos because it's, it's combination. It's really fusion cuisine, but, um, but that's a longer story I'll tell you later. But, uh, but that's their comfort food. And it's certainly not something that I grew up with. Um, all I have to add um, is that um, I, I would say that moving away from home, I, I grew up in Jersey, so that's like, you know, one state away, right? But um, I, I went to college in California, um, and I think that a combination of that plus becoming a food writer or whatever accidentally uh, made me look at my mother's labor in a completely different light mm -hmm. um, in the sense that, you know, I grew up in a very patriarchal um, household and uh, my parents had an arranged marriage and uh, my mother, in addition to being the breadwinner of the family, was also uh, the one who performed all domestic tasks, including cooking. Uh, and it was one that the culture that surrounded her immediately uh, did not, uh, you know, really appreciate. Uh, and. I think that it was writing about food that made me understand uh, the nature of those inequities um, you know, a bit more and also helped me reframe these foods that I grew up with, like herluchi, uh, like you know, so many other Bengali staples, um, as works of art, even if she mm -hmm. herself uh, did not see them uh, mm -hmm. in that uh, way. And uh, it just kind of reminded me of what is so exciting about food as a narrative tool, which is that you know, it does touch everything. And it really is, uh, you know, not to sound corny about it, but it does you know, provide a window into the way that we live and certain inequities that we might uh, you know, be predisposed to overlook. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> Let's uh, give them a big round of applause, everyone.